moments after Prince Harry helped raise the iconic Invictus Games flag on the top of Sindy Harbour Bridge, he comforted a serviceman's widow who joined him on the climb. Gwen Churn, 41, who was one of the select group scaling the bridge with the prince, shared how a sympathetic Harry listened to the story of her late husband, Australian Special Forces Officer Peter J. Cafe, who died by suicide in February 2017 at the age of 48. The pair spoke for nearly 10 minutes on the descent and the prince asked about her children, Emily, 6, Lachlan, 3, and stepson Tom, 19, and how the family was coping. Lachlan is the spitting image of my husband. Harry said something like the children must remind you of him, or live on in him. And I said my son is so much like him, Churn, who grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, tells people. It was comfortable and thoughtful. Churn says Harry, who lost his mother, Princess Diana, when he was just 12, and her spoke about grief and loss. He understood what I meant. When you understand loss, I think it's obvious, she explained. He did ask me if I was getting the support I need from the defense and ex-servicemen and veteran community. She works closely with U.S.-based Tragedy Assistance Program for Survivors and talked to Harry about their partnership with the UK's Diana Award. Harry, who is touring Australia with pregnant wife Meghan Markle, 37, was on the bridge to help herald the start of his Paralympic-style contest for wounded, sick and injured servicemen and women and veterans, which starts in Cindy this weekend. As the 34-year-old prince's entourage tried to move them along from the outing, Harry wanted to ensure they had enough time to talk. He stopped and said, I'm in the middle of a conversation, and I'm not going to leave this. We were talking about my story and mental health and how difficult it is still, in our society, to talk about grief and loss and suicide. And how important things like the Invictus Games are to shedding light on, and allowing people to start to have these conversations that are great to have. Churn, who is an advisor for widows, veterans and families for the Australian Department of Veterans Affairs and an Invictus Games Ambassador 2018 as the grief is the basis of so much suffering. We are not dealing with the daily losses we have or the major losses of a husband or a son. Heaven forbid we actually talk about suicide and the real causes of it and that it is more complicated than just one issue on one day. She added, the fact that he and Meghan are shining their light on the Invictus Games, highlighting for so many people the service and sacrifices the serving members and their families, and highlighting their families, gives people hope. Harry asked quite a few questions about my story, so he had it correct in his head, she says. Chern met Peter, known as Pete, when she was working in development in Afghanistan in 2008. He re-enlisted in the Australian Army in 2010, joining the Special Forces, 2nd Commando Regiment, in 2012. She moved to Australia, giving birth to Emily while he was on deployment to Afghanistan in 2012. Then four years later, while deployed in Iraq in first half of 2016 he suffered a stroke. He had shown signs of PTSD, anxiety and paranoia during our entire relationship. But after the stroke his cognition was not improving as quickly as he would have liked it to. The only sign was that he wasn't processing things as quickly, and he had a small black spot in his eyesight, she explains. When you're in a high-performing environment, like the special forces, when you're not performing at your highest, you can tell that, Chern said. That created a lot of anxiety and pressure for him. He started losing thoughts. He didn't believe defense had his best interests at heart, even though they were telling him everything to the contrary. And he became really angry and violent on the Friday and then on the Monday morning he died by suicide in our garage. Me being involved in the Invictus Games has actually got me out of bed. I gain resilience, churn shares. I don't have to climb a mountain today, but just put one foot in front of the other. She says Harry and Meghan are doing so much good with their place in the world, using their power and their privilege. Many of our leaders could learn from that. They are changing people's lives because of it. They are changing the way we are looking at mental health globally because they care, they are paying attention to it, and flying that Invictus Games. That is changing and saving, lives every single day.
The royal tour is at such a hectic pace it would exhaust anyone, let alone a three-month pregnant woman carrying the precious cargo of the Queen's next great-grandchild. But behind the warm smile and energetic enthusiasm she is pouring into her first royal tour, Meghan Markle is sensibly caring for her and Harry's first child. The Duchess of Sussex has built secret rest breaks into the dizzying schedule she and Prince Harry have stuck to in the first three days of their Down Under visit. On day one of the tour at the Opera House, after running 20 minutes late for their descent of the Grand Steps, Meghan and Harry were whisked away with security saying she was unwell and needed a rest. Asked about the Duchess of Sussex's health, a media representative on the ground in Sydney told News.com. Oh, it was nothing and that Prince Harry's wife was perfectly all right. On day two, however, after arriving at Dubbo Airport, meeting school children and then royal flying doctor service patients, volunteers and staff, the royals vanished out of the back of the hangar. Asked where the couple was, their representatives told News.com. Oh, the Duke and Duchess were just having a break, for about 15 minutes. Next they were whisked off to the sheep and cattle farm outside Dubbo, where Meghan memorably presented the banana bread she had baked in Admiralty House's archaic kitchens. Running late for the community walk among a buzzing throng of country locals at Dubbo's Victoria Park, the royals arrived just as lightning struck and the heavens opened. Prince Harry could be seen clutching an umbrella and his wife with a strong arm around her as they stood beneath an umbrella with the rain teeming down. It was then Meghan's turn, with the diminutive duchess in her high-heeled black suede boots holding the brawly above her tall husband's head as he delivered his speech about men's mental health. With time against them, the royals took off for a slightly abbreviated walk among the locals in the park. And then they disappeared again, for about 20 minutes, before reappearing to take off in the royal motorcade on the fifth and final Dubbo stop, to meet indigenous students at Dubbo College Girls Academy. The Royal Australian Air Force plane taking the Royals back to Sydney took off from Dubbo Airport around 3 p.m., the end of what was considered a short day in the tour. Wednesday in Melbourne was another busy day with six events, again with the Royal couple running behind schedule, perhaps because of breaks added in for the expecting mother. But Friday should provide Meghan with a respite from her elegantly turned out stilettos on Bondi Beach where the Duchess is expected to go barefoot for a meet-the-people walk. Meghan and Harry are due to meet one wave, the Bondi Surfing Community's Mental Health and Well-Being Awareness Group. They will take part in Floro Friday, where people share their experiences with mental health issues and interact with others while surfing and doing yoga. After Bondi, however, it is expected Meghan will peel off from Harry and go back to Admiralty House for a break. The Duke is due to climb the Sydney Harbour Bridge on Friday afternoon with Prime Minister Scott Morrison and Invictus Games competitors to raise the Invictus flag. Late in the afternoon, Meghan and Harry will meet opposition leader Bill Shorten at Admiralty House, followed by the Duchess meeting the PM. By Friday evening's receptions meeting opposition leader Bill Shorten and the PM again at Admiralty House, the Duke and Duchess will be able to mark off 23 events from their crowded tour. Only 53 to go. Apart from a visit to Fraser Island next Monday, their Royal Highnesses will mostly be attending Invictus Games events in Australia. But the eager communities of Fiji, Tonga and New Zealand await the royal couple's arrival for further days of their event-packed Pacific visit. Meghan's supportive entourage may have more of her secret breaks schedules for the blooming Duchess to put her feet up. One thing she doesn't have to sweat about is appearing beautiful for the ever-present cameras, the Duchess of Sussex seemingly incapable of taking anything but a great shot. Just five months after walking down the aisle of St. George's Chapel, Windsor at her own royal wedding, Meghan Markle has relived the moment once again this time for the nuptials of Princess Eugenie and James Brooks Bank. This afternoon, the Duchess of Sussex was spotted arriving at the iconic southeast of England location dressed in a navy blue Givenchy coat dress. With her hair styled into a low chignon, she teamed the look with a matching and Noel Stewart chapeau and Manolo Blahnik BB pumps in navy suede. 
The look was vastly different to her own wedding day look on May 19. On her big day, the then bride wore a Givenchy boat neck cut dress designed by creative director Claire Wade Keller, a diamond encrusted hairband borrowed from the Queen, previously owned by Queen Mary and a 5-meter veil with unique flora embroidery from every Commonwealth country. In August, the royal was seen attending the wedding of Harry's BFF, Charlie Van Straubenzi in a chic club Monaco dress, a Philip Tracy fascinator and Aquazura heels. Walking hand-in-hand -hand with her husband, Prince Harry, the Duchess beamed as she waved to royal fans. Markle's appearance at the nuptials comes days after it was revealed the 37-year-old took on an unofficial role as wedding planner for her husband's cousin in the lead-up to the big day. According to the Mail Online, Princess Eugenie and her fiancé Jack Brooks Spank made a trip to see the couple around a month ago for Meghan to help the bride-to-be with her wedding plans.